Okay, so a couple of announcements. You have in your possession the midterm, or excuse me, the final review, right? And so remember that the final review or the final exam is cumulative, which means that about 30% of the information is going to be on the phyla and the characteristics and macroevolution and that kind of stuff. And then the other is going to be over what we have gone over in anatomy and physiology. So if you look at the very last page, there's some questions, right? These are going to appear word for word on, I'm not going to choose all of them, but some of them are going to appear word for word. When you do these essay questions, it will also aid you in um, learning the material for the multiple choice, I believe. So you want to do this so you can um, have a study group if you wanted to do it, and you can help each other answer the questions. And you can feel free to ask me if you have any like problems, like I have no idea how to start answering this question, and I can lead you in the right direction. Okay. Or does this is this the right answer to this question? Am I in the right flow in the right way? And I can help you with that as well. So you could come uh, on Wednesday prepared with those questions. Um, this Wednesday, or you could come Monday because we're going to have class, regular class here on Monday at finals week, and that was something that the administration put into the schedule. So hopefully it doesn't conflict with any uh, of your other um, classes. So um, also, uh, you're not going to have quiz seven, so everybody's going to get, I'm just going to put 15 points in for quiz seven, and then I'm going to subtract the two lowest quiz scores. So you don't have to worry about quiz seven since I was ill last week. The other thing is your Wikipedia article is due by midnight tonight. So remember, you need to upload it into Turnitin. And um, your lab uh, report, your final lab report, which remember is worth 50 points, and you got a little page sheet describing how to put it together, right? That one is due on Thursday. So. Um, you know, did I make it so you turned it in? I can't remember how that works. Maybe I'll put it at a turn it in place on Thursday. I don't think I, I put a drop box in the thing. So I'll do that. I do? Okay, good. Okay, so that, that's due. And then your um, lab practical, which is also worth 50, 50 points, is on Thursday. And it will be multiple choice. Um, and it will be over all the lab material. So what I would do is I would just study the lab material before coming to, to lab to take that test. Um, and then there was something else I was going to say. I can't remember what it was. The lab practical is this Thursday. It's this Thursday, yes. And then your final exam is um, a week from this Wednesday, from 1 to 3 p.m. And it's listed on this sheet. Okay, any other questions? Oh, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> so you're going to keep the lab notebook so that you can study it for the final exam. So you're going to turn in your lab notebook when you come to the final exam. And I'm going to try to grade it and get it back to you before you leave. OK. So we're talking about the nervous system in lecture. And we actually um, started talking about um, reflexes and the sensory system, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well. When we were talking about the central nervous system, I mentioned that there's a forebrain, a midbrain, and a hindbrain. And this is in vertebrates. And so this is kind of demonstrates the way that our brain developed in that it was a hollow tube first, right? And then that tube folded back on itself. And so our largest part of our brain is what? What is the largest part of our brain, which is also part of the forebrain? Cerebrum. Right? So the cerebrum right, consists of two cerebral hemispheres. And this is significant because the outer part of the cerebrum, which is called the cerebral cortex, right? In us, it is highly folded, and so we have these jiri, these ridges, and these indentations called sulci, and that creates a large surface area over which we have neurons that are responsible for conscious perception. And so this is conscious perception of sensations. And motor control. 
right? So I can send out signals to my arm to bend, for example. Okay, so that's the cerebral cortex. And remember, we talked about mapping the cerebral cortex and that um, action potentials from different parts of the body um, go to different parts of the cerebral cortex, and that's how we um, correctly perceive our surroundings. Okay, if the action potentials go to the wrong part of the cerebral cortex, we would incorrectly perceive our surroundings. And so we talked about sensory mixing sometimes, or synesthesia, how sometimes the action potentials go to weird places and get mixed. Okay, so that's the cerebrum. Now the two cerebral hemispheres are also connected by white matter. And what is that connection called? What is the connection between the two cerebral hemispheres? Yes. So the corpus callosum, connects the two cerebral hemispheres. So that's also part of the forebrain. And in some people who have really bad epilepsy or seizures, um, sometimes they'll sever that corpus callosum and that seems to um, help treat the seizures. It decreases the seizures. Um, and it also is kind of interesting. It doesn't seem to have that deleterious of an effect on the body. So. It's kind of interesting because um, you know you think that that connection between the two hemispheres is really important. Okay, so that's the biggest part of our forebrain is our cerebrum. The next part includes um, the hypothalamus. Okay, and so I'll talk about what the thalamus is in a minute. The hypothalamus is a part of our forebrain that is responsible for thirst, appetite, hunger, emotional reflexes, which I'll talk about in a minute, and sexual arousal. So these we can perceive consciously, okay, all of those things, but the hypothalamus regulates them unconsciously. It's also um, near or interacts directly with the pituitary gland. So I'll put it that it interacts with the pituitary gland, which is our major endocrine gland in our body. So remember, endocrine glands produce hormones. So the pituitary gland is really important. We'll actually talk a little bit about that when we get to um, reproduction because the pituitary system regulates female and male reproductive cycles. Okay. The third part is the thalamus. And it is actually a little bit larger than the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is underneath the thalamus. So we'll show a picture of that in a second. But the thalamus is a regulator, or it's a relay station for all sensory information. So I'll just put that it's a relay station. And so I'm just kind of, um, I'm not going into details about these, you probably do in psychology. Sensory information. Okay, so taste and smell and um, touch all go through the thalamus before they actually get to the cortex where we consciously perceive them. And that will be important in a minute. Okay. The fourth part is called the epithalamus. And what does epi mean? Does anybody remember that root? Uh, above, yeah. So epi, like the epidermis, the skin, right? The epithalamus is above. And this has another name. This is called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland also produces what they sometimes refer to as a candidate hormone. They think it's a really important hormone. Does anybody know what the pineal gland produces? Nope. Oh, it does? <laughs> that was the one I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what that, what that is. <laughs> Okay, so what is it else that produces? The main hormone. It regulates your sleep-wake cycles, so you can actually buy it over the counter. Melatonin, right? So melatonin regulates circadian rhythms. 
So circadian, circadian, So you said DMZ or DMT? DMT, I'll look that up. Okay. So it is really interesting because the pineal gland um, is buried under our cerebrum, yet it regulates our sleep-wake cycles depending upon whether it is light outside or dark outside. And so um, it does this so that it releases melatonin in dark. So it's released in dark so this is why right when people are on the opposite cycle and have to work all night it's really important for them to to make their room look dark right or wear an eye mask or something so that their mel melatonin will be released right and then when they're working at night they're generally in front of bright lights right so it's hard to go to sleep when it's really bright outside and that is because melatonin is not released yeah how does this relate to like sundowners? Does that happen at night long? Like people that have sundowners where they like they get um, more energized. Yeah. Is there are they energized all night long, or just in the dusk and the dawn? Um, mammals. A lot of mammals have what is called a um, crepuscular activity cycle. So that they're actually most active right at dusk, and they're most active right at dawn, and then they sleep through the night, and then they take a big long nap during the day. And so that's a lot of that's what mammals do. Um, but um, I don't know how it works to people that are reversed, um, how this affects their melatonin. The people that I know that have reversed day-night cycles, like that um, stay up all night, like gaming or whatever, they actually have a hard time sleeping. Like they go through periods of insomnia. And so the people that I know, it seems like their melatonin is all screwed up because they'll go through periods of days where they don't sleep, and then all of a sudden they'll just crash, right? And so it could be that they're just messed up melatonin. But um, we should sleep at night, and we should be more awake during the day. But I know I know people that don't do that. <laughs> okay, so this is the epithalamus or the pineal gland. And so if we look at where these are located in the brain, the thalamus is actually located right here. So it's kind of like in the center, right? And then your hypothalamus is located underneath, and this is a diagram from your book. And then this is the pituitary gland. So they don't have here labeled the epithalamus. So this is my pineal gland, right? So they don't have that labeled there, but um, I wouldn't ask you what it, where it is on this diagram since it's not labeled, but this is the pineal gland. And so you'll see that there's really no way for, for it, it makes sense it's buried. But if you look at in reptilian brains, this pineal gland actually is directly stimulated by light and dark. And the reason why it's directly stimulated is, is that they have a transparent scale on their eye. So in a reptile, this is what is referred to as the parietal eye. So this actually allows light to come from the top, down from the top of their skull and stimulate the pineal gland directly, right? So this is kind of similar to what the Hindus use. They have the third eye, right? So that would be like the parietal eye. And so if you think about it, our third eye, if you look at where that would be, that would kind of go back into the center of the brain, right? So we don't have that. So what happens instead is, is that impulses from our optic nerve um, get to that uh, pineal gland, and so when there's lower impulses coming from light from the outside, then um, we sense it as darkness. Okay, so it's kind of interesting the evolutionary origin of the pineal gland and what happens in mammals. They do, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so if we look at what is referred to as emotional reflexes. So we talked about reflexes in lab. So we looked at the knee-jerk reflex, and we saw that um, it is a fast response to stimuli that doesn't involve conscious thought at all, right? You just kick your leg, right? So the interesting thing is, is that we also have emotional reflexes to stimuli that we cannot control immediately, but then upon further thoughts, we can kind of dampen it down. 
Okay, so I'm going to use an example, a kind of a psychological uh, experiment, classical conditioning experiment with a rat. So let's talk about rats. So this isn't a rat, not in a human. Okay, so we have um, a sound and we have a shock. Okay, these are two different types of sensory information. They're sending action potentials into the nervous system and they go through the thalamus. So these both come in and here we have the thalamus. The thalamus can then send it to the hypothalamus. Okay, and the hypothalamus can cause the fight or flight response. Okay. And this is a reflex, so it's fast. So I'm going to put fast here. It also sends the information to our cerebral cortex. So we can consciously perceive, so the rat can consciously perceive the sound and the shock, and then they might move away from it, right? And so this is slow. So this is conscious, and this is unconscious. So in a classical conditioning, they would then remove the shock, right? And so what happens is, is that the rat has learned that the sound is something that they'll respond fearfully to, right? So they respond fearfully to it. Okay. But the other thing that they can do is, is that they can remove this, right? So they can actually cut the connection to the conscious part of the brain. And so what happens is, is that the sound occurs, the rat reflexively responds, like his heart rate increases, his breathing rate increases, but he doesn't consciously perceive the sound at all, right? So he's not actually conscious of the sound at all. And so there are some stimuli in our environment that cause these um, emotional reflexes, and then we ask ourselves, what is wrong with this, right? And so we can kind of learn this type of reflex as children. And then oftentimes we have to unlearn it as adults. So a good example of this would be like if you were raised at, um, with an alcoholic and they were, you know, kind of loud and obnoxious and that um, made you develop this whenever you see somebody um, drunk, you have a fight or flight reaction, right? So you say, and as a child, that was a really good thing because it protected you, right? It was an emotional reflex that was protected. But as an adult, if you're walking down the street during Roundup and you see these drunk people across the street um, from you and you have the fight or flight reflex and you, you're like, what is wrong with this? Like, all of a sudden I'm all anxious. You know, I don't even understand why I'm acting like this. Why do I feel like this? It's because you have that emotional reflex that has caused you to have that. Right. And so they have um, there's a really actually a pretty nice book um, and he's probably written other things now, but it's called Emotional Intelligence. And this is by a guy named Goldman. I think there's probably lots of emotional intelligence stuff out there now. Um, but Goldman is a, a MD who talks about how you find these circuits that have that are in your body and then you can always consciously override them right so the thing about the hypothalamus is it doesn't just regulate fight or flight but it also regulates sexual responses right so if you put sexual response in here you can see that sometimes we become, or that we are higher height, we're kind of like um, hardwired to respond in a certain way to sexual imagery, right? Because that's what we are, I mean, we're sexual creatures. And so if you see something that is sexual, sometimes you can have an unconscious sexual response to it. And then you say, what is wrong with me, right? But it's hardwired into your body to respond in this fashion. And so then you have to consciously think, oh, well, that was just a reflex. That was interesting. And then you say, oh, but that's not something I'm interested in. 
right? And so you can kind of override it. And so emotional intelligence doesn't have to do with just the fight or flight, but it can also have a sec the sexual response is also part of that. Okay. So the interesting thing, since I have been thinking about this and researching it, the interesting thing that has come up is, is that some of these conditionings right here can actually, they now think they can actually be inherited through um, epigenetic um, markers on your DNA. And so what that means is, is that for some, for at least for mice, they have discovered that if they train the mother mouse to be fearful of a certain smell, her babies, having never been exposed to a smell and a shock, for example, together, will also be fearful of the same smell, right? So there's evidence that suggests in our past that if your ancestor has had a bad con you know, connection here, and one might be like, a one that we might have could be the snakes. So let's say that once you see a snake, you jump back, right? And that is in maybe an emotional reflex because maybe the snake isn't something that's gonna cause you harm, but that's something that is hardwired. And so they have this new idea besides just emotional intelligence and they call it intergenerational trauma. Okay, intergenerational trauma. And it's inherited through what is called epigenetics. And epigenetics has to do with little tags that is attached to your genetic material when you have um, um, a, a, a experience, and then that affects gene expression. So you don't need to, I'm not gonna go into detail about that, and I would never test you about that. But it, it controls the how your genes are expressed. So in the case of the mice, the mice are more sensitive to cherry smell. The genes that would control for that sensitivity are uh, turned on at a greater rate than they would be in a normal mouse. So it's kind of interesting, this whole new era of epigenetics and how um, these types of emotional reflexes could be passed down from parent to offspring. And I always wonder, like, so I have a friend who is just, like, so scared of mice. I mean, like, she totally freaks out. It's like, what is up with that? You know, it's like, I'm not afraid of mice at all. I think they're really cute and darling, but she can't even stand pet hamsters, for example, right? And so it's kind of interesting. You could wonder if there was something back in her, um, back in generations, if something happened that connected those two to that fight or flight reflex. Yeah. What about like the bees? Like the bees smoking? Mm -hmm. Is that the same kind of relationship? Um, no, the smoke probably affects their uh, nervous system. What do you think? I don't know. That's a good question. So, yeah. Because all bees, they have that same response to smoke. It calms them down. And then they go be hunting and then they get ready to take it. And that's their response. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's a really interesting example. Bees are amazing. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> their ability to learn is amazing. <laughs> okay. And communicate. Okay. So, this is, should be actually emotional. Sorry. Emotional reflexes. That's why I'm just right down there. Okay. Any questions about this idea? Okay. Also, the, uh, oh, that's the limbic system. So this is the limbic system. This is emotional responses. That's what that's called. Okay. So this includes, the limbic system includes the hypothalamus, but also the hippocampus. And does anybody from psychology know what the hippocampus is? Memory, Memory yep. And a structure of the brain called the amygdala. Amygdala. I don't think I spelled that right. It's on my paper. Let's see, amygdala. Uh, yeah, okay. And then also the cerebral cortex. And also, I want to write down this one because this is interesting, the olfactory bulb. 
And so one of the things that's interesting about the olfactory bulb is this that you learned in lab last week that's really hard for you to describe a sense. And you might have also discovered that you tend to describe smells based upon memory. So it's like, oh, that smells like my high school gymnasium, right? Or, oh, that smells like, like my grandma's bathroom, right? And so smells tend to be more associated with emotions and memories than, say, for example, sights, right? So when I look in this room, it doesn't, you know, I don't think of a memory because I, I can describe it so well. But when I'm uh, consciously trying to think of smells, oftentimes the only thing I can think of is memories that are associated with that smell. Okay. So the limbic system is specifically emotional responses, and the cerebral cortex is that conscious. So you can override. So the idea is, is that you can still override right, that, um, um, that emotional reflex um, and dampen it down and unlearn it, hopefully, if you, if you want to. Okay. So I'm going to skip the midbrain, and so we're just going to go to the hindbrain. And so the hindbrain includes the cerebellum. So this is oftentimes confused with the cerebrum. Okay, so it's not the same thing as the cerebrum, so, so just look at the word cerebellum. Okay, But it kind of looks like a cerebrum, but it's in the back of the head. And so it actually has hemispheres too, and it is specifically responsible for motor coordination. Right? So it would be like for walking, even crawling before that, right? Crawling, standing. So if you think about everything that you have to do in order to not fall down as you walk across the room, all of the muscles that have to um, alternately relax and contract, right? That is... Um, uh, the development of the cerebellum. And so, um, specifically, it is important in kind of learning body awareness. And um, if I was to argue, this is the part of the brain that drives children to kind of like run around all the time and, and kind of want to run around. So if you think about children and play, when they play, it's very physical. So, you know, it might be they're bouncing up and down on the couch and then they do a forward roll or whatever. And what they're developing is their cerebellum when they do that, right? Um, so uh, that just develops um, that coordination and it's a really important part of, of childhood. Um, when you look at other organisms like, even like I studied antelope, when you look at pronghorn antelope, for example, the, the offspring spend a great deal of time like the babies spend a great deal of time running, right? And they're just kind of developing their coordination. They also kind of kick and they play fight, right? So they're developing their coordination. So uh, recess, for example, is really important because that's the time when kids start to, can use their cerebellum and develop coordination. Okay, it can also seems to be responsible for some higher things like playing an instrument, okay? Maybe even texting, I haven't thought of that one. Right? But driving, etc. So you get to the point where you're like, um, you've been driving all day and you can't remember any of it, right? Because it was all kind of reflexive. It was kind of unconscious, shifting, turning, that kind of stuff. Okay. So it becomes a real unconscious, so we don't have to think about it all the time. Okay, that's the cerebellum. We also have the medulla oblongata. And this is what is responsible for autonomic reflexes. So when we talk about autonomic reflexes, this is, as I mentioned before, right, glands, heart, smooth muscle, So vasoconstriction and vasodilation of heart arteries, right? Increase and decrease in heart rate, the diving reflex, the signals were coming from the medulla oblongata to either speed up or slow down your heart. Salivation, right, glands, um, the production of enzymes by your pancreas, that would all be um, coordinated by the medulla oblongata too. Okay, 
And then we have, um, actually, I'm just going to skip. There, some people talk about the pons, but I'm not going to talk about the pons. And then we have, from here, the spinal cord. So you notice from lab that there was gray and white matter in the spinal cord as well as in the brain. And this time the gray matter, which is the nerve cell bodies, are actually on the inside. And the white matter, which are the tracts, um, are on the outside. So the spinal cord is still part of our central nervous system. And it's protected by vertebrae. And what is in the center of our spinal cord? Yeah, CSF. So the cerebrospinal fluid runs down the center. Okay. And sometimes when doctors want to get a sample of that, they do what is called a lumbar tap. So they go down here, and that's because your spinal cord actually ends somewhere up here in the middle of your back. And then what happens is the spinal nerves run down. So they do it down here because they know that you're, they're not going to damage the um, spinal cord proper, that they, if they do accidentally um, get too far in, they would just um, hit a nerve, which is a lot less dangerous than actually hitting the spinal cord. Okay. okay. So when we look at the spinal cord, oops, we have what is called the dorsal root. And this contains sensory receptors. And then we have the vitral root, which, oh, not sensory receptors, sorry, sensory neurons, which contains the motor neurons. Okay. So you should review the um, anatomy of the reflex where it, if you stretch the muscle, the quadriceps muscle, it sends a signal to the spinal cord and then out, and it causes my muscle to contract in order to prevent it from overflexing, right, or overstretching. Okay, so my muscle will contract in response to sensory receptors that are located in my muscles. So coming out the spinal cord are the spinal nerves. And so the spinal nerves are actually part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay. So the peripheral nervous system includes cranial nerves out of the brain. So these originate in the brain. Right. So the one cranial ner nerve that we looked at would be an example of this would be the optic nerve. So in your dissection of the cow eye, you saw the optic nerve. There's also nerves that innervate the muscles surrounding the eyes and allow the eye to move. Okay. There's also nerves that go into your nasal cavity and be, are able to be, pick up information about um, chemicals that are in the air. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. And then from the cranial nerves, we have the spinal nerves. So these actually exit from between the vertebrae. So it's really interesting that our spinal cord is segmented so that we have um, spinal nerves exiting from the segmented vertebrae. And then we also have associated with spinal nerves ganglia, which are um, uh, the, where the nerve cell bodies reside. Okay. So if we just look at a spinal nerve, I'm going to talk about a motor. Um, neuron, right? So this is my motor neuron, and it is in the spinal cord, the cell body. So the cell body resides in the spinal cord. The axon leaves the central nervous system and travels in a nerve to the skeletal muscle. So 
So it's actually quite amazing how long these cells have to be. I think I mentioned this before. If my motor neuron's up in my spinal cord, and then the axon has to leave the spinal cord and go out and innervate all of the muscles in my legs and allow for motor um, movement. So if we look at a diagram that shows these, okay. So here are my cranial nerves coming out and innervating my face. So they would like, for example, allow me to um, talk, to move my face, blink my eyes, all those kinds of things, and also to sense. So some of them are motor, but some of these ner nerves are also sensory. And then notice how we have the segmented system coming out. These are little ganglia. So they contain nerve cell bodies, and then these nerves are just bundles of axons that carry action potentials out to the skeletal muscle. And so if not today, on Wednesday, we'll talk about um, how the, um, the motor neurons innervate the skeletal muscle and cause them to contract. So the last thing I want to talk about in the peripheral nervous system, oh, here's my cranial nerves. So this is my actually my optic nerve and it crosses over. This is my olfactory nerve. These are the different cranial nerves that regulate um, body. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system has two components. So we have the parasympathetic division. It uses a type of neurotransmitter that is really short, relatively short acting. So the neurotransmitter it uses is acetylcholine. Okay. So acetylcholine is short acting because we have an enzyme that breaks it down when it's released into the synapse and it's broken down by acetylcholine esterase. So acetylcholine esterase, which means that it's rapidly degraded. So it's, it's relatively short acting. Now, some of the chemical weapons that we have developed actually use this information and can cause people death, right? And so, for example, the nerve gas sarin and the insecticide malthion Malthion, I don't know if there's an E on there, does it? Okay, Malthion both inhibit inhibit ACH breakdown, acetylcholinesterase breakdown. Okay. So we'll talk about acetylcholine in the muscles, but if you are exposed to nerve gas, the nerve gas serin, or even the insecticide malthion, which you have to be really careful with, and sometimes it's, I think it's still sold over the counter. Um, what happens is, is that acetylcholine will collect in the synapses and will essentially shut down the heart, right? And it'll shut down the breathing because the parasympathetic division is what decreases heart rate and decreases breathing rate and it also causes, causes muscles to con stay contracted, right? And so this is how those chemicals work. If they don't, if it doesn't break down, then it just stays in the synapse and just will shut you down until you go into a coma and die. Okay. So this is rest and relaxation. Rest, actually rest, um, relaxation, and digestion. sympathetic nervous system, 
This is the fight or flight. So the neurotransmitter that is used is not acetylcholine, it's norepinephrine. Another word for that is adrenaline, right? And this is long acting. In fact, it is also a hormone. Right. So the example from your book, or one of your essay questions talks about what is the significance of this? One being short acting and one being long acting. The importance is, is that um, you want to be able to respond to a dangerous situation really quickly. So let's say, for example, if you're in your house and you just finished dinner and you're watching TV and you're really relaxed and you're almost asleep, right? And that would be parasympathetic, that sensation of like blood going to your gut, you know, your digestive system is working, you know, you're really calm and relaxed. Your eyes even will constrict a little bit. The pupils of your eyes constrict, right? You, you kind of salivate, that kind of stuff. Um, that is all parasympathetic. And then if somebody comes running through your door, um, that is immediately almost overridden because it is short, so short acting. And then you get the sympathetic response where you're like, oh, you know, what's going on? I'm so, what the hell, what's going on, right? And then what happens is, is that, say it's just your friends and they just are, are excited about something, and you're like, man, I was almost asleep. Now I'm never gonna be able to get to sleep, right? That's the long acting, right? So it's like, if you get excited, you have a nightmare, and you are you can almost feel it. All of a sudden, your heart will just start to like go like crazy, and you're like, and it's just like, it seems like it takes forever to get the norepinephrine out of your system because it is a long-acting neurotransmitter. And that is designed so that you can respond to dangerous situations really fast and overcome the parasympathetic division. Okay. Now, one... Um, thing that we have in our life that requires a coordination of parasympathetic and sympathetic is the sexual response. So the sexual response is interesting because oftentimes it doesn't work properly, right? And um, in order to complete it, you have to have um, one thing and then the other, okay? So the first thing that has to happen is, is that your parasympathetic nervous system <coughs> causes um, erection. Okay. So in the male, that would be the penis. In the female, the clitoris, which the clitoris is actually quite big because most of it is inside um, and not exposed to the outside. So that would be blood moving to the um, tissue and um, being excitable, okay? So that's the parasympathetic. And then the sympathetic nervous system has to override that parasympathetic nervous system, and the sympathetic nervous system causes um, orgasm. So we'll talk more about this when we get to the sexual response, but um, orgasm, um, in males um, is related to ejaculation, and in females it would be um, also um, related to spasms that are found in the vagina. So this requires a coordination, right? Coordination. And they say it's really the only um, thing in our bodies that seems to require, you know, one happening before the other in a linear fashion. So in your book, they have these diagram that shows, um, well, we're not gonna talk about that one, that shows um, the sympathetic division versus the parasympathetic division. Um, you don't need to know this, but you'll notice that the, all the fibers that are coming out from the center of the spinal cord are sympathetic. And then the ones that are coming down from the brain and the sacral region are tend to be parasympathetic. And you'll notice that the sympathetic decreases digestion. So it would decrease the activity of the pancreas, but it also increases the activity of the heart and um, other things. 
Um, when you're in fight or flight, it inhibits the secretion of saliva, so you get that dry mouth, right? But you also sweat because the sympathetic nervous system is the only system that innervates the sweat glands. Sweat glands and blood vessels are only innervated by the sympathetic. And so then you can see all of the responses here, right, to the parasympathetic nervous system, which would be the relaxation. And then do we have a sexual one? Yeah. So this was the one, the erection, and then the ejaculation um, or vaginal contractions. OK, so let's just take a five minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about sensory um, systems.
Nobody moved. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the lab practical, there's going to be stations. And so you're going to go to a station, and it could be like a slide. It could be like a partially dissected rat or a fully dissected rat, right? And it'll have some questions. I might have a pin and an organ and say, this organ is the A, stomach, B, small intestine, you know, et cetera. It could have an organism, so it could like have a, a C star and say, this organism is in the phylum, and it'll give you options. It's all multiple choice. Um, so actually, it's a good to start reviewing that information because it will help you with the final exam too. So the you know it's only worth fifty points, which is not a lot, but um, it'll help you when you're studying for the final exam. Okay. okay. So sensory. The sensory. Um, division of the nervous system because these are actually modified neurons and these um, these specifically absorb the energy of a stimulus the stimulus energy They take that stimulus and they transduce it into an action potential. And we now know that an action potential is just a temporary change in the membrane potential where it becomes positive 30 instead of negative 70, right? <laughs> so this process of taking the stimulus and turning it into an action potential is called transduction. And transduction is different depending upon the type of stimulus you're talking about. So one type of stimulus is chemical energy. And the types of receptors that are responsible for these are called chemoreceptors. So what generally happens with chemoreceptors is, is that a chemical binds to the receptor. And this causes sodium gates to open, and sodium floods into the receptor, and an action potential is opened. Okay. So this is the process of transduction. So they turn this into, I'll just put AP, which is action potential. So that binding of, um, to a receptor, actually, I'll write, sodium channels open. and depolarization occurs. Okay. So our sensory receptors that are responsible for taste and smell are examples of chemoreceptors. Taste we talked about, there are little receptors that are in the taste buds that give us information about salty and sweet and umami. Smell is a lot more complicated, and the reason why dogs can smell so much better than we can is, is that they have many, many more different types of receptors. So where like we have a thousand different types of receptors, they might have 10,000 different types of receptors. So their ability to smell is much more refined than our ability to smell. So if we look at, um, oops, my wrong way. If we look at the nasal cavity, right? The cool thing about our nasal cavity is, is that at the very top of the nasal cavity, and this is not where I always have to remind myself this. This is where, like, where your finger would go if you're picking your nose, right? This up here is very, very sensitive, and so it's actually just simple epithelial tissue that can bleed, right? And there's also sinuses up here. So this is nervous tissue. So the nervous tissue actually comes down from the olfactory bulb and goes through these tiny little holes in your skull. And then they stick down like little finger-like projections. And when you breathe something in, it binds to little receptors on the surface and opens sodium-gated channels. 
and then it sends an action potential to the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is then part of the limbic system, and it goes to the emotional center of the brain, and then you can have reflexive reactions. So there's some idea that we respond reflexively to people's smell um, that we're not even like consciously aware of, right? So pheromones might um, play a role here. Um, the type of people you like might be based upon how they smell to you. Okay. So those are chemoreceptors. We also have um, mechanoreceptors. So this is mechanical energy. So this could be like stretch, right? So we actually have stretch receptors in our gut. And so this tells us we can't eat anymore, right? And when I was an undergraduate, um, there was people, there were people in, my, in the department that were doing work with these mosquitoes, and they had somehow disabled the stretch receptors in the mosquito digestive tract, so that the mosquitoes would actually drink and drink and drink and drink the blood until they just burst, right? They're just, it's kind of, it was a very impressive demonstration, right? And that's because they weren't able to detect the stretch, okay? Our muscles also can tell stretch, right? And our joints also have receptors in them so they can tell the location and the position of our arms relative to one another or our legs. So stretches and, and joint position. So I'll put joint position. We also have touch, right? So when we touch the surface of the skin, this actually changes the shape of the receptor and that change in the shape causes the sodium ion channels to open and an action potential to be produced. The other one that's really important and kind of a little bit confusing is um, hearing. So we're gonna talk about the ear today, but we have these little receptors that are called hair cells. Okay, and the hair cells have cilia. So this is a hair cell with cilia. So cilia are just cytoplasmic extensions, and then this is the end of its axon. So when sound waves come in to our ear, they bend, they mechanically deform the cilia. So the cilia bends, and then that opens the sodium ion channels, and um, an action potential is generated. So in hearing, that's what that is. So the bending of the cilia causes depolarization okay and we'll talk about where those are located in the cochlea of the ear in a minute so those are mechanoreceptors we also have a special type of receptor called a nociceptor and these are pain receptors and and they actually respond to chemicals released from damaged tissue Right? So we can actually perceive pain in our organs. Right? It's kind of interesting because sometimes if our um, stomach is upset, sometimes we'll also perceive it, or if our organ is upset, sometimes we'll also perceive it on the surface of our skin. But that is just because of the way that the, they share a common pathway into the central nervous system. So nociceptors are super important, right? I don't know if you've heard, there's some some people that are born without nociceptors, and they, in poor little babies, you know, if they're not feeling the pain, they will just eat away at their fingers. They'll just, eat, you know, they'll bite their tongue. They don't feel any pain when they damage the, their, their body. And so it's really, really bad to have no nociceptors because you don't realize that you need to avoid self inflicted injury. Okay. We also have photoreceptors. which absorb light energy. And we talked about this in that, remember the pigment that absorbs the light energy is called rhodopsin, and it disassociates when it absorbs 
So it goes from rhodopsin, you should have this in your lecture or in your lab notes, but retinol and opsin. So what happens is, is that this disassociation then causes depolarization. Okay, so it causes um, an action potential to be sent into the central nervous system. Now, some organisms can also detect electricity. So we can have electromagnetism or electromagnetic receptors. Right. So, for example, sharks can sense the electrical activity of their prey. So can platypus, ductile platypus. They actually hunt by sensing the electrical activity of small fish and crustaceans and vertebrates. Yeah. So is that why, like, um, if you like grab a shark on the nose, they actually sort of freeze for a second. I've never grabbed a shark on the nose. Well, no, like, <laughs> they're in charge of this. Oh, like, oh interesting. Up, like, up, like, grab their nose. Oh, maybe because they're messing with their. Yeah, that is why they say not to thrash around if you become injured. So they interrupt their. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know that. But that, it might be. And then um, magnetic receptors. So some organisms actually are able to orient based upon the, the magnetic poles, right? So when you talk about homing pigeons, um, or if you talk about other bird migrations, the, the reason why they can always migrate in a certain pathway is, is that they actually have receptors that can detect the magnetic fields of the Earth, and they can follow them, right? There's actually some evidence that we have a little bit of magnetite in our skull, and that we might be sensing magnetic stuff um, in the environment, too. Okay. Okay. So again, taste. Just simply in those taste buds on your tongue, there's receptors that bind to chemicals, and then that causes sodium channels to open and an action potential to be generated. So that is actually one of your little essay um, questions from your um, final, um, or for your final exam too, is how do we perceive the difference? Okay, so let's talk about hearing. So let's talk about the um, ear. And specifically, we'll talk about the outer ear first. Okay. So our outer ear functions by capturing sound waves. So the larger your ear, you know, the more sound waves. So you can like hear better and make your ears larger by cupping your hands around them so you can hear more. Right? And so some mammals and other animals have huge ears to capture better, like foxes, huge ears to capture more sound waves. Okay. So then they uh, move it down the auditory canal. So this channels the sound waves to the tympanic membrane. This is the same thing as your eardrum. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute, but this eardrum will vibrate in response to the sound waves. So it's taken sound waves, and it's now turned it into mechanical energy, right? So the vibration right, goes into the tympanic membrane. Then we go to the middle ear. And this is where we have ossicles. And there's three of them. They are called the stapes, the malleus, and the incus. This is, you might have heard of these before. This is the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Right? But you need to know stapes, malleus, and incus. Okay? So those are ossicles. Those are tiny little bones in your ears. And they actually have like little synovial membranes, so they actually have joints, just like our arms do. And they vibrate in response to this. And the thing about these ossicles is, is that their role is the amplification of the sound. So they amplify the sound, so they make it louder. And the reason why this is important is the sound waves have to go from air, and then they have to go into the cochlea, which is fluid filled. So they have to make the, the sound waves stronger. So they, they must be stronger to go from air to fluid.
only mammals have these ossicles, those four. I think, I think reptiles might have one. And the ossicles are actually believed to be uh, similar in origin to our jaw. They were the gill bars. And so we lost some gill bars and they became incorporated as bones in our middle ear. Okay, so this middle ear is often the source of ear infections because it is connected to the pharynx by the eustachian tube. So this connects middle ear to the pharynx. So that is the back of your throat. And so if you get an infection in your sinuses or in your respiratory tract, right, it can go into the eustachian tube and then it can cause swelling and then the eustachian tube closes up and your ears become plugged, right? So this is a particularly a problem in children because they have really short eustachian tubes. And so you probably, if you weren't one, you probably know some kid that was chronically ear infected and what happens when you get um, pressure buildup is sometimes it can cause the tympanic membrane to rupture. So the eardrum ruptures and all the pus comes out. I had a nephew who went to 30,000 feet in an airplane and his eardrums ruptured and all this yellow goop just started coming out. Right? So they generally, what they do is they put little tubes in the ear um, to prevent that from rupturing and causing damage to the, um, and causing permanent hearing problems. Okay, so then we have the inner ear. This is hardly ever infected, and if you ever do get it infected, you will know, because this is like, there's a really strange place in the inner ear. It causes problems with balance and vertigo. And so you might get up and just fall down, right? You'll have problems with your balance and equilibrium. So the inner ear includes the cochlea, and this is where the hair cells are. And so this is sound perception. But we also have in the inner ear um, a structure called the vestibule and the semicircular canals. And these are equilibrium and balance. So the cochlea is specifically responsible for our perception of sound, whereas like the vestibule tells us when my head is like forward, when it's moving back. The semicircular canals are movement, so they would tell me like when I'm accelerating, when I'm rotating around different axes, like. When you go on a, a carnival ride, the reason why you get all crazy is because you're messing with the fluids in this part of your inner ear. Okay. Okay. People that have problems with their inner ear say that it is, I mean, it is just so bad to have that problem because you just simply are constantly dizzy. You can imagine your life being constantly dizzy and not being able to walk even. So it's a really bad um, thing to have problems with. Okay, so let's look at a diagram. Okay, so this is the diagram from your book, right? So ear canal, that's the same thing as the auditory canal. This is my tympanium, right? This is my middle ear, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. You don't need to know the difference between those. The thing that's really interesting about the sound waves is, is that they move into the vestibule and the cochlea and the semicircular canals through what is called the oval window, okay? So sound waves enter, enter the inner ear via the oval window. So what this is, is this, this, this is a membrane that is flexible. And so when the, Pincus, the malleus, and the stapes move, they create a, 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 a fluid-filled wave, right? So the, the inside of the inner ear is filled with fluid. So um, then they exit the round wave, the round window. 
So if we're going to put energy into this closed system, we have to have a way for energy to leave. And so they exit the round window. So that's, you should know, uh, the oval window is where the stapes is right here. This is the round window. This is the vestibule. These are the semicircular canals filled with fluid. And then this is the cochlea. Oval window is right here. So it says here, stapes attached to the oval window. Yep. So it just moves, and then it causes a kind of a wave in the fluid that is this filled with these um, part of the spot. This thing. Okay. So we're going to watch a little six-minute, seven-minute video that is a um, kind of a summary, a little bit more information than obviously you need to know, but it's um, really interesting. I think. The sense of hearing is accomplished by a process known as auditory transduction. The ear converts sound waves in the air into electrical impulses, which can be interpreted by the brain. As sound enters the ear, it passes through the external auditory canal, where it meets the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then vibrates in response to the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch or frequency produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume or amplitude produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher frequency sounds produce faster vibrations. The tympanic membrane is cone shaped and articulates with a chain of three bones called the auditory ossicles. They consist of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, passing on information, frequency, and amplitude. The three bones pivot together on an axis shown here in red. is due to a series of ligaments which hold the bones in place within the middle ear cavity. The anterior malleal ligament and the posterior incuda ligament are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympani nerve and the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. Through the ossicles, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transferred to the foot plate of the stapes. The stapes moves with a piston like action, which sends vibrations into a structure called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is filled with a fluid called perilin. If it were a completely closed and inflexible system, the movement of the stapes would be unable to displace the parallel and therefore unable to send vibrations into the bony structure. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the parallel, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth. <laughs> The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spinal portion of the bony labyrinth, known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spinal passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scale of tympani. 
A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross section, the membranes separating the two fluid filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale of the stibule. The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale of tympani. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea, whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. Together, this sequence of events is responsible for our acoustic perception of the world around us. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we perceive sound and the difference between frequency and amplitude and how it is um, our ability to be able to detect that. Are there any questions about that video? Okay. Okay. So if we look at the um, cochlea, um, remember that the cochlea, cochlea is actually it's called cochlea because it's a sh it's a snail-like shell, and that inside the cochlea we have the hair cells. And so if you take that cochlea and you unwind it, it becomes a kind of a straight tube. And you can look at the end of the tube being the apex, and then this one being um, further down on the, what do they call it? The apex and the base, okay, down on the base. And that actually um, responds to different frequencies. So when we look at sound waves and we look at frequency, so this would be time, for example, and this would be, um, energy, so this would be amplitude. So this would be the size, okay? If we have um, sound waves coming in, like this, okay, versus, I'm gonna draw another line here, versus this, okay? Which of those lines would represent the low pitch, the blue one or the purple one? Blue, right? So this is a low frequency, oh, excuse me, high frequency. Wait a minute, low frequency, low frequency. So this is a low pitch, right? So the hair cells um, that would vibrate would be near the apex of the cochlea. So hair cells 
near apex of cochlea vibrate. So this would be the opposite. This would be the high frequency. So this is the high pitch. And it would be the hair cells near the base of the cochlea. Okay, so it's almost kind of like an instrument. And I can't remember, does, would it be the, would a bigger, on a guitar, would a longer, or maybe on a harp, is it the longer string that is lower or the longer string that's higher pitch? The lower pitch, wouldn't it? The, if you have a harp, the bass? The longer string would be higher pitch. It would be, the high, longer string would be higher pitch? Lower pitch, right? Yeah. yeah. So that actually relates to the length of the hair cells. You don't need to know that, but so the hair cells here, would be shorter, and then the hair cells there are actually longer, right? And that creates the, um, that's why they absorb the energy different. Okay, and so then the amplitude has to do with this, with the um, size. So this would be a soft sound, and then this would be a loud sound. So this would be loud, and that would be soft. And this actually has to do with how far the hair cells will bend. And so there is a point where the hair cells will bend so far that they don't pop back up again, and then you get hearing damage. And so if you look at a, a picture of these hair cells, this is an electron micrograph picture. So this is using an electron microscope that shows the images. This is healthy hair cells, right? This is hair cells that has been damaged by, could be damaged by, you can get viruses or bacteria, but generally it's the sound, the, high, the loud sounds. And so this is why people that work construction and don't use hearing protection um, or work in other areas where they have problems with loud sounds, right? Um, or musicians. And so I always can't, can't believe when I go to um, music at, like small bars and stuff because the sound, they have it so loud that it's actually physically painful for me. And you can always tell whether or not you've kind of damaged your hair cells. If you leave and you hear this, you know, after you've been in a bar for a while and it goes, you hear that like that weird sound in your ears. That means you've done some permanent hearing damage. You want to avoid that, right? So I'm always like the person with the earplugs at the music events, but anyway. That's because I, my hearing has been damaged already and I don't want to lose any more, okay? So loud sounds can actually damage your hair cells and there's no way to get them back. Yeah. Is, is that also right here? Like, you know, you're just, you're something to that? You know, I do get tinnitus and they don't really understand tinnitus, but tinnitus will happen. So like if I go to a bar and I don't wear hearing protection for like a month afterwards, I'll have this and like, I think, in my opinion, I think that the musicians have damaged their hearing, and so that's why you can't hear themselves just <laughs> being so loud. They're like, it sounds great, and whatever the real is like, ah. Yeah. So it's important to protect your ears. Yeah, I'm not sure about tinnitus. Tinnitus can have different effects, but I do have that problem with, with hearing too loud of sounds. And my one pet peeve is the air dryers in the restrooms. Like that, that's, I, I believe that is way over the loudness limit, right? So I'd refuse to use the hair dryer or the, the hand dryers in the um, restrooms because it's just so loud. Okay, so let's just look at equilibrium. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about equilibrium. So equilibrium can tell us the relative position of our body to gravity. And some organisms have really simple um, mechanisms that do this that are kind of interesting. And so an example of this 
is a statocyst in crayfish. And the statocyst has in it these little um, calcium carbonate um, balls. And when the crayfish is upright, um, those balls press on the hair cells that then send a signal to the brain telling the crayfish that it is upright. So if we look at this, this is just a, a picture of a statocyst in crayfish. So this is, they have this near their brain. These are the little balls, they're called statoliths. And what happens if you turn a crayfish upside down is, is that these balls go in the wrong direction and then they would stimulate this up here, right? And so the crayfish knows it's been flipped over on its back and so then it can right itself, right? Um, interestingly, um, the reason why these are so interesting is that they were one of the first examples of, of manipulation of this equilibrium apparatus. They actually put, they removed these and actually put magnets in there instead. And so the crayfish could be right side up. And if you put a magnet right here, it draws these magnetic balls up, right? And so the crayfish thinks it's upside down, even though it's right side up. And it will just flip and flip and flip and flip and flip because it, every time it flips, the magnet draws them up and it thinks it's upside down, so it flips again, right? And so that would be um, uh, homeostatic imbalance, right, of, home, of equilibrium. And that's only a crayfish? Or? No, this is the simple one. We have this in our bodies too. So we have um, in our ears, right, we have the utricle and the saccule. And so we have what are called autoliths. So you don't need to know these, but we have in the vestibule, we have these little um, uh, membranes with autoliths, and so they look more like this, okay? So in our inner ear, we have ear stones, autoliths, that's what that means. And it sits on, um, and, on some hair cells in kind of a membrane. And so it would change um, as gravity moves, right? It would move those autoliths, and it would change the um, action potentials that are being generated. So if I'm right side up, there's no action potentials being generated because I know I'm right side up to gravity. But if I'm upside down, then my my it's those that tell me that I'm upside down. Okay. I you could probably mess with me. Yeah. If you put and nobody's ever tried it with humans, <laughs> but if you could change those and put those autolysts. Some people this is really bad. Some people get those autolysts damaged. And so then they're constantly, that's that constant, yeah, and that's not being able to orient properly in your equilibrium, and um, it's a really bad <coughs> thing to have. So I don't know, like dogs, like when they're on their back, they don't, they're, they're not comfortable when they just get up. Like when you scratch your stomach, like they'll lay there for a second, and when you stop, like they just stand right straight up. Well, they know their head's upside down. Yeah, they would know their head is upside down, yeah. I mean, there's other things that tell me my head is upside down. Though, because it could be uh, mechanical receptors in my neck, right? It's not going to tell me, but they, I know when I'm upside down because of the movement of those. Okay. And then the semicircular canals, I think I have a diagram here. Oops, I forgot. Okay. The semicircular canals um, have fluid in them. And so when you rotate in a particular plane, it causes those, um, that fluid to move. And it's the same thing, that movement of the fluid causes these little cells, these little hair cells, mechanoreceptors to bend. And they tell you that you are moving in a certain plane. And there's three of them. So it's kind of three different planes of movement. Okay. So we'll stop there for today. And so I'm going to say we're going to talk about skeletal muscle. So remember that you need to know, you need to know the, um, the structure of the eye from lab, right? So for the final exam, you still need to know the eye and the photoreceptors, even though we didn't talk about it specifically in here.